gonna just briefly, okay, I'm gonna briefly introduce myself. Um, like Mike said, I'm an engineer in electronics. Um, I've been a research assistant in quantum computing here at Universidad Ort for the past uh, two and a half years, roughly. Um, I've done my, both of my dissertations um, in engineering in quantum computing. And since then I've started my master's in the same area. And today, um, Mark invited me to talk about being a woman in quantum. And since, well, you know, we do science, um, I wanted to talk uh, not only from my experience, but um, based on data. And I couldn't find much data on being a woman, specifically quantum. So what I did was um, come up with a bit of um, information about being a woman in academia, engineering and STEM in general. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about my experience being a woman in quantum. So without further ado, I'm going to share. Hang on, I've got my presentation somewhere. Okay. Yes, here we go. Okay. Like Mark said, um, the title of my presentation is What Would Have Been If Schrodinger Had Been Born a Woman? Um, and to begin with, I would like to introduce you to a few women who maybe you know, it would be great if you knew them. I had no idea they existed before I got into um, studying a bit of uh, the gender inequality in sciences. This is Annie Jump Cannon. She was, I think she was German, I can't quite, or English, I can't quite remember that right now. Never mind. She pretty much invented the scale by which uh, stars are cataloged nowadays. Um, even though I don't remember the name of, this, of, the, of the scale, it takes up to a male scientist whose name I can't really remember, um, who was his, her tutor. Um, so she did a lot of work and she never got re recognized by, for that. Um, even if the scale she came up with is still used nowadays, um, no one really knows her name. She doesn't come up um, in science books or if you Google her, like you really have to know her name to find her. Another example. Carolina, can I just jump in for a second? I think your microphone is, is brushing against. Uh, oh, my, yeah, my story. Yeah. There. Uh, is, yeah. Is that better? Pro probably. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Cool. Please. Um, as I was saying, this is Annie Jump Cannon. I'm going to go with another one. This is Valerie Thomas. She's actually American. Um, she is pretty much the person who invented holograms. Uh, she worked in in optics for a while in the 1960s, 1970s. Um, nobody knows her either. At least I didn't know her or she's not, uh, she doesn't come up again in books. Um, she did a lot of research. She got recognized for it, um, but she's not very famous. This woman you might know because she uh, she's quite famous right now. Um, she, this is Lisa Meichner. She's pretty much called the mother of um, fission, of nuclear fission. She did research in the 1940s in Germany and in Austria, I think, um, into quantum fission and quantum fusion. And um, well, she got uh, she was prosecuted because she was Jew in, in Germany. She never got to publish her work, but her colleague who worked with her, who actually published um, her work, won a Nobel Prize for it. Um, she has recently resurfaced in an attempt um, to um, regain, um, to bring back these women, um, to recognize the, the work in science. And this is probably the most famous case. This one is the one we generally know. This is Rosalind Franklin. Um, she is nowadays credited as the person who discovered the DNA helix. Um, she came up with a famous picture in the Watson and Creek paper uh, that won them the Oscar. Um, it's actually a picture she took using um, x-ray diffraction. That picture was stolen um, from people who worked with her at the same laboratory, but were kind of her rivals. They were given to her rivals at another laboratory who published that paper. Um, she died uh, under a great injustice. She didn't know, I mean, she knew the picture was hers, but she never got credited for it while she lived. She was only credited years after um, when a sort of um, revision process started in science, trying to reclaim the works of these women. And so these are many other women, a few of them actually, because there's many more. Uh, Catherine Johnson worked for NASA. She was also 
driven to get a lately because there was this movie and a book called Hidden Figures. It was pretty famous. Grace Hopper created the first compiler. Eddie Lamar, um, pretty much the technology behind Bluetooth. Vera Rubin, Dark Matter. Barbara McClintock, something in biochemistry I can't really remember. Genes, I think, but I can't really remember. Um, Margaret Hamilton, well, again, computers. Nettie Stevens discovered the sex chromosomes. Rita Levi Montalcini discovered the neural growth factor. And you know other, well, the famous, uh, I think it's the only woman I ever knew doing my undergraduate courses who had a theorem with her name, um, the one with symmetries in physics. Florence Siebert invented um, the first test for um, tuberculosis. Jocelyn Bellburner discovered quasars. Chen Xun Wu um, made a couple of great contributions to um, proving the, the standard model, to disproving the standard model. And these are some among many other women, not only in science, but um, in technology in general, because there's also a bunch of them who came up with inventions. For instance, um, the coffee filter, the paper coffee filter that you use here, we call it V60. I'm not sure if that's like an international thing or if it's just here. Um, but that was invented by a woman called Melita. Among many other who basically dedicated their lives to contribute to science or to technology and who today are not really recognized. Katie Lamar is famous because she was also a Hollywood actress. Um, but most of the other women are not famous for her, their work. Um, this is another case which I discovered recently. I didn't know um, this ever happened. This is the girl, the woman on the left is Henrietta Lacks. She is the reason we have immunotherapy nowadays, pretty much. Um, back in the, I think it was the 1940s, around the 1940s, she died of a really strange tumor. Well, they discovered that that tumor had the first set of human cells that never died, that would replicate forever and ever. Um, those are the HeLa cells that they nowadays sell and everyone uses in labs around the world. They are still used um, and they pretty much, they are credited with like the birth of immunotherapy. Um, as you can see, they're called HeLa because it is a contraction of, their, of her name, but trying to find where they came from was really difficult because they tried to like, not dehumanize it, but um, kind of remove the fact that there was a person who had a a really dangerous health problem behind it. But again, they're used around the world nowadays. Um, they are, so, they are um, children of the original cells that someone took um, against her will. They didn't know, she didn't know they had taken those samples and they were sent to a lab who then sold them around the world. And why do these things happen? Why are there so many women who directly or indirectly, like in this case, Sabieta Lacks, um, made contributions to science, even, I mean, from every approach, as researchers, as a poor woman who just happened to go to the hospital because she didn't feel well. Why are all these women uh, not famous as their male counterparts? Well, the culprit, um, this is kind of a really bad pun, but the culprit is called the Matilda effect. It's been an effect that's been studied in science and it's now recognized, it carries a name of a feminist. Um, the Matilde effect explains uh, a sort of bias against women in science and how women have to work harder in men than men to be recognized for their work. And I want to, to show you um, data from my country because it's where I, I know uh, I've been here, I've worked in a couple of universities and I know my way around here. Um, I wanted to show you statistics um, and STEM, we're going to cover engineering in electronics, engineering, computer engineering, physics, math, and biology. Um, so we can kind of see that disparity across um, STEM here. The graph on top on your left shows freshman year statistics for electrical engineering. My apologies, the graphs are in Spanish. Um, they, were taking for a, they were taken from a survey. Um, as you can see, uh, the dots in blue are women, the dots in red are men. Um, there's pretty much three or four men for every woman in freshman year in electronics, in electrical, actually. 
the average across the years from 2008 to 2018 is a 20% average of women versus an 80% um, average of men. Um, something even worse is seen in computer engineering, which is down below. The colors are still the same. Blue is women, red is men. Um, where the statistics show that about 17% of the students who come into freshman year are women um, versus that uh, 83%, which are men. These are all statistics taken from um, the annual survey that I should have explained that. Um, there are there is one major um, state university here, which is Universidad de la República, which we uh, for short call UDELAR. Um, that's the main university here and the one that offers um, the widest range of careers. <clears throat> there are a few <coughs> private universities um, like ORT, the university where I where I work. Um, but UDELAR is the one that caters for the majority of students um, because it's free. You only get to pay your degree once you've finished and you've got you've actually gotten your diploma. Um, and it's also the one that offers the widest range of careers. If you want to study science, there is no other way or other university to study it here than UDELAR. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. I want to show you, uh, let me see, I think I'm missing one, no. I want to show you the statistics um, for professors in the university, um, particularly in the Faculty of Sciences of this university. Um, let me explain this because it's something that just our system has. The rows on top, the, um, yeah, the rows on top uh, that say they go G1, G2, those are the, the degree of professor that we have. Um, the first degree would be something like a student who's still, still undertaking um, undergraduate courses, who helps um, doing exercises and that kind of stuff, or um, tutors other students. And then uh, G5 would be a full-time professor. Um, and so as you can see in physics, even though at the first stages of the career, we are still significantly less than men. Um, it's at 13%-ish for the first uh, degree and 26% at the second. As you go further up, there are virtually no women. No women. That's 16%. See that stage four is a single woman. It's one single teacher, one single female teacher um, who still works um, in physics. Then in math, something similar is seen, but there are no women who reach the final two stages. Um, so that you can have an idea, you can go from a, from a grade one to a grade two, having a master's degree, two to three, having a doctorate, a PhD. And then from then on, it's just um, experience piling up um, in teaching and postdoctoral research that gets you to four and five. In biology, something um, quite peculiar is seen. That's why I wanted to show you this. Um, even though at the first stages of the career, the first three stages of the career, women are a majority with an average of about 57% of the three stages. Once you start going further up in that career and in time, that situation reverse, reverses. Um, and at the highest stage, we get around 13% women. And that hasn't changed. The statistics we're taking again uh, over the past 10 to 20 years. Um, these are also taken from statistics uh, from the university, from Facultad de Ciencias. Uh, what happens again in engineering? Same graph, different universities. Um, in electrical engineering, we can kind of see the same pattern as in physics. At the beginning, um, there is about 15 or 20 percent women, and then as you go further up, they decrease. There is uh, one, two um, full time professors, uh, which is actually uh, strange for like in the good way, but it's strange to see that. In computer software, something similar to biology is seen again, where, um, well, not biology because they're not majority, but um, that average decreases over the, the stages. Again, um, these were also taken from an annual survey that the university does again. And what about that happens uh, being a woman in quantum here? Well, uh, my connection is unstable. Okay, I think I've got it again. There are three um, 
Okay. There are three research groups here in quantum computing. One at ULR, the university whose statistics we're just seeing. One at Universidad Ort, which is the university that, um, that I'm representing here. And one at another private university. And there's also one um, startup, one quantum startup called Quantum South, which is also a spin-off from um, Universidad de Montevideo, which is the only other university that I told you about that have quantum. Um, I can tell you about my research group. Currently, there's seven of us in the group. There's two full-time professors. There's me and one of my colleagues who are doing our masters. And then there's a few undergrads. I am the sole woman of that group. Um, and I have been the only woman in that group for the two and a half years that I've been working there. Prior to that, there was one other woman, not one other woman. And then um, at ULAR, there's about 10 or 20 people working, an average of three women. And at the other university, again, there's like seven people, one single woman. Um, I thought it interesting to tell you the story of how I got into quantum because it's actually um, the story of people believing in me. Since I was a kid, I wanted to study physics. I almost majored in physics. I took um, the first three years of the, of the Bachelor in Sciences, and then I switched. Um, when I switched, uh, along with that, went my hopes of working in quantum. Because, you know, I had that idea that if you didn't study physics, then how the hell were you going to end up working in quantum? Maybe a bit short-sighted of me, but I, I was like, 18 at the time, so I can't really blame myself. And then when I switched to electronics, um, one of my teachers came up to me and said, hey, we've got this group, this research group, we're looking for a new um, research assistant. You could also um, start your project with us, your thesis. And that's kind of how I got into that. Someone came up to me and said, you've got the experience. I know you like this field. How would you like to join us? And I know that I've been incredibly lucky for it, that um, I could have, I could have not been so lucky. I could have not come cross paths with someone um, who wanted to build that bridge. Um, so, being a woman in science, it's so difficult in the sense that there is so few of us. And the situation seems to be stable over the past 20 or probably more years. What can we do to change it? Why is it that women um, don't choose careers in sciences? And when they do, they do not get to the same stage as, this male, as their male counterparts. Well, there is, there's a series of studies and I've got um, references for all of these. So in, if any of you would like to read um, the papers from which I took this or the research, email me and I'll gladly send it your way. Um, there's a couple of research done from, there's pieces of research done by UNESCO and um, a few American and Spanish universities that show that um, that bias, that gender bias towards science starts as kids. Kids aged six, male, uh, girls and boys, were asked uh, what they thought a scientist looked like. And they generally, mostly, if not all of them, do men. Why is that? Well, partly because we do not stipulate girls and boys to like the same things. That, that is kind of changing, luckily. But so far, we haven't really um, motivated girls and boys to explore their full potential. So I found this graph online, which I really liked. Um, so when you, next time you have to choose a toy for a boy or a girl, and you find yourself asking if it's a toy for a boy or a girl, then this graph can really sort it for you. Okay. Um, what have, have we done to change that? Like I said, what have we tried to implement to change the situation of, um, the gender inequality in science? Well, the last Thursday of every April is International Girls in ICT Day. And here in Uruguay, um, universities, mostly, most if not all of them, and a few <clears throat> enterprises um, have started this, 
these sort of workshops for women, for young girls actually, where we will bring um, girls aged like 12 to 17 um, into our offices and our laboratories. And we'll show them what we do and how there's women who work in electronics, women who work in telecommunications, women that work in computer science, and that we are not um, superheroes. We are just, we were just girls who liked science and we, or STEM generally, and we fought for a career in that. Um, sorry again that the banners are in Spanish. Well, the last one is felt like a girl in English. Um, but these are mostly just advert advertisements um, for that day, for the workshops. Um, I was part of the workshop at Universidad de la República, which is the one on the top left. We would put together four different workshops um, in electronics, digital electronics, and um, computer science. Um, we would make them, we would have girls program a robot to follow a certain path and something. And something that we kept seeing a lot was girls going, um, I can't do this. I'm not smart enough to do this. Even if they were surrounded by three other friends of their age and they had um, a teacher with them at all times, um, they would mostly go for that. I have no idea how to do this because I'm not smart enough. That's like the phrase that we kept seeing time and again, year after year. Um, and we're trying to work to change that. These teacher, these workshops are only taught by women. Um, men can always help and um, be in charge of organizing the event, but the teachers, the first time teachers are all women. Um, same goes for the, the workshops at the enterprises. That's the same idea. The idea is to show them, like I said, that there's women in the area and that um, if they don't like the area, then that's fine. You don't have to pursue a career in STEM, but maybe you like math or you like computer science or whatever, you like some sort of branch of science and you haven't considered undertaking a career in that because someone in your family or among your friends or your even your teachers said, that's not a career, a career meant for women. And that's not it. We're trying to change that. And what do we have to change? Well, these are a few of the phrases that we have come across um, as women in STEM. Um, the classic, at least here, engineering really, math and physics are, topic, are difficult topics, you know, um, as if we were born, um, as if men were born superior to women. Um, I don't know. I just really don't get where that comes from. Like, I don't really get the point. Even if you're trying to discourage me, it just make me angry. Um, we, when we put together the workshop for women in electronics, um, we had someone go, you're, te you're teaching a workshop on electronics for women. Are you going to give them pink cables? So among the many, many things that we have to change, um, the concept that pink is a girl color. Um, then there's also a phrase that we hear a lot that is, no guy is ever going to want to date you because you're intimidating. Like no guy is ever going to want to date a woman who's smarter than him, I guess. That's where it comes from, which is really ridiculous, but never mind. Um, what else? Well, scientists in pop culture. As kids um, and as young adults as well, all the series and the movies that we watch uh, portray scientists stereotypically, stereotypically as heterosexual men. Um, there's Dr. Emmett Brown, who I love, and my dog is called Emmett Brown because of him, but he's a guy. Um, Robin Williams in Flubber, the name of the scientist completely escapes me right now, um, but again, men. Um, Ghostbusters, men. Doctor Who, except for the last one, men. Um, the Big Bang Theory, don't even get me started on that one. Um, Rick and Morty, men again. And I was actually thinking that the only female scientist that I could think of in a pop culture um, TV series was um, Dark. I don't know if you've seen it, Dark. It's a sci-fi, uh, a German sci-fi TV series. Um, it touch, it brushes uh, against quantum at times, uh, but it's got one female scientist that I could think of. And then I couldn't think of any other 
shows or movies that showed um, female scientists, even as the movies that I watched as a kid, I was as kids, I was born in the 90s and I couldn't think of a single example. Um, so this is pretty much my talk. I wanted to close with this picture of this girl um, playing, uh, pre pretending to be an astronaut. Um, my point being, try to stimulate the women um, that surround you, be it your daughters, uh, your nieces, your sisters, your mothers. Um, if there's any woman around you that you know, well, even if you don't know for a fact that they've faced these biases, even if they're not in science right now, even if they're kids in school, and um, they really like Legos, but instead of Legos, they keep getting dolls. Try stimulating that girl. Um, try letting her exploit that area. Um, because this is costing us a lot. This gender bias in science is costing us a lot. Um, it's making careers extremely hard for women in the field. It's making it hard um, for us um, to be able to uh, move forward with our, with our careers. And if you are a woman in STEM like me, um, I would very much encourage you to encourage other women in the field. Um, if you can somehow help another student. Uh, the Sarah Jane Adventures, I haven't, I've never saw that one. Um, I'll look it up. As I was saying, if you're a woman in science and you can help another woman in science whose career is a little bit um, behind yours, um, if you can undertake a master's student, a doctorate student, or even, not even that, like, if you can give a word of encouragement to a woman who is around you, who works with you, who has faced, um, well, this injustice, please go ahead, because you have no idea what that means. Thank you very much. And if there's any questions, I'm here for you. Thank you, Carolina. That was fantastic. And I, I think you've given us a lot of good ideas. Um, does anyone have any questions? I was going to say, I love the Hi. movie Contact, by the way, um, that starred Jodie Foster as a, a woman astronomer. Contact, right. Yeah, I was born in the 90s, so. <laughs> that, that, that's right, but it, it, it's one of the very few that uh, that prominently features women scientists. Yes. I'll look it up. S sorry, I think I interrupted someone. Did someone have a question? Hey, um, hi, this is Ram. Thank you very much for this talk. And um, I, I do have a question. You know, I I have wondered about this and I, I've asked my female colleagues to, you know, help me understand. They've not been able to help me understand. What is this self-doubt that, oh, I don't think I'm good enough? Because well, this is true. I have seen it. I have experienced it. And it has left me stuck that we are in the middle of doing something. Suddenly the person says, actually, I don't think I'm good enough. So uh, could you help? Well, I think at least for me, and maybe that's not a universal answer, but for me, that stems from a series of reasons. First one, someone in your environment, not even your career, your environment being your family, your friends, um, even your partner has doubted you before. Um, that's one. For instance, uh, your father going, maybe engineering isn't really a career meant for women. Why don't you think about studying another career? So it starts there. It starts with a small seed when you're a kid. And then you get to university or to high school even, and a teacher goes, really, this is what you handed in? This is not nearly good enough. And obviously the problem there is your teacher and not you, and they're not being able to communicate um, your insufficiency, basically. And so I think it, it slowly starts piling up. And when you get a different, uh, like a bunch of people in your circles consistently doubting your work, it starts to pile up and you start to believe that. And you start to think, maybe that teacher that I had in my undergrad courses were right, was right. And I really am not cut out for this because maybe you wrote a paper and you sent it and it didn't get accepted, for instance. And then it keeps on building up and building up and building up. And it gets to a point where it doesn't matter how much approval you get um, from people in the field, you just don't believe it because you've been convinced for so many years that your work was not enough. That's really, really hard to change that. So that's it for me.
Does anyone else have any questions? All right. Uh, thank you again, about, Carolina. Excuse me. Oh. Excuse me. I've got one more. I've got one more question. Y yes, so, Ron? Uh, yeah. What is your success rate? Uh, uh, maybe success rate is a wrong phrasing. What um, what kind of positive signs are you seeing uh, with these special classes that you hold where you're encouraging uh, women to, you know, come learn science and, and, and computers? Okay. Um, the first one for me is just, they're not compulsory. Okay. We just open up the invitation to any girl aged 12 to 15 who is willing to come accompanied by an adult. An adult being anything from a parent, a grandparent, a teacher, um, a tutor, anything, anyone who is um, an adult will do. So if they can find someone to come with them, then that's fine and they're welcome. And we have, at, at least for me, the success rate is that we every year have to had to deny um, girls a place because we've had so many requests, far many more than we can manage with the resources we have. Um, that project that I was telling you about, we are just six teachers. There's only six of us putting everything together, um, organizing the event, putting together the materials that the girls need and teaching the classes. And every year we get far many more requests um, than we actually can, can satisfy. Then also the second thing that we get a lot um, that I really enjoy is teachers um, then texting us or emailing us, showing us uh, works that their girls have done on the workshop. And many of them going, I didn't know there were women in this field. I just thought it was a man thing and that I could never get into this. I didn't, I didn't know if I even liked it because I didn't know what it was or what an engineer in electronics did. And now at least I know that they put together these things or they talk about Morse code or something. So to me, the success rate is measured in two things. First one, um, you, um, these girls open their, you open doors for these girls to a world that they probably don't know. Because most of, at least I, I really liked electronics because my father um, is a radio amateur and he has been so for the past 40 years. So I grew up surrounded by cables, but I was extremely lucky because of that. If it hadn't been for that, I would never have known what an engineer in electronics did. And um, pretty much that's it. Uh, opening doors for girls who didn't know electronics existed or what they did. And also um, that when we get that feedback, when you get a teacher saying, thank you very much, because I really wanted to do something for the girls because they are all going to study, I don't know, some other thing. And I know that some of them like science, but well, they weren't really motivated to pursue a career in that because they didn't know anyone who was a role model. So to me, that's pretty much it. Good. Does anyone else have any questions? All right. Thank you again, Carolina. That was fantastic. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Thank you it. very much. Sure thing. Thank you, everyone. Bye.